those are um, conditions that make up that concentrate the fish in such a, a tight area that it, it's like every sailfish within a hundred miles of there is right in that condition. And that really what you have going on. And, and the reason I say that uh, confidently is because I think it was the very next day and definitely the, the days following that. I mean, we caught 76 sailfish and I think we went the, the day after that, not, not the day after, but the day, you know, two days after. And there's, they were, they were just gone. I mean, that whole body of fish had moved up the road and because it's so concentrated, there's no stragglers around it. Right. I mean, every fish within miles is in caught up in that one condition. This is the Tom Rowland podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is tomrollandpodcast.com and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on tomrollandpodcast.com and the social media is tom underscore Roland R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. I'm Captain Sam Malazzo, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Sam, what's up? How we doing? Man, I'm doing great. You already been out there today, huh? Yeah, I feel a little burnt. Got a little sunburn, I think, today. Yeah. Yeah, what are you fishing for today? Uh, we have one guy, he wanted to catch some mutton snappers and, uh, it was a little tough for us, but, um, he's a customer long line. He's, I've had him come on the boat plenty of times and, uh, sorry, I feel like I'm already messing this up. You're not doing any, you're not messing anything up, man. Um, so you, uh, he wanted mutton snappers today. Yeah. I mean, we went out there, we, we tried to lie bottom up the road and, uh, it wasn't too good today, No, but this is, uh, that wants to do something really specific though yeah Makes it's just like when a fishing tournament comes to town and you're supposed to yeah. go catch that one species and then something happens and they're not as easy yeah. to find as they normally are yeah i've yeah. been there um so this time of the year you'd use you'd be fishing for sales a lot i'm assuming that that's that's really starting to heat up for you right yeah it was really good like you said right before the tournament yeah. and then it kind of tapered off and it's, you know i didn't fish this last tournament but a lot of the guys that did it sounded like it was slow yeah it's kind of t- yeah so you've you've done awesome in all those tournaments but lately i've been when i follow you on social media man it looks like you've been doing a lot more hunting than you have been fishing um you got got the hunting bug yep yep how long have you how long have you had the hunting bug like that i mean the way i like to explain it is that i like to fish but i love to hunt is that right woods yeah yeah that quiet time especially now that i have you know my kids are getting a little older and just nice to get you know it's just it's quality time very yeah. quiet and what do you are you mostly hunting whitetail or you got other interests what do you what do you like to hunt yeah i mean you know here in florida the hog the hog hunting's pretty easy plentiful so we you know that's a quick little trip you can get away and and usually get that done pretty quick um for the weekend or something so we do that and uh but yeah if i have you know some significant time during the hunting season i'm going to be chasing the whitetails just nice. I don't know something about that. I mean, there's other things I'd like to do, but if I got two weeks and that's all I got, I'm going to put my effort into that. Now, where did you just go? Cause you killed a, a monster. 
Yeah. I mean, it was probably the second, you know, biggest deer I've ever killed. I've been hunting since I was 12, 13 years old. I'm 43 this year. And so, uh, but yeah, we were up in Missouri. Um, I was blessed enough to have a, a good friend of mine invite me up to some just unbelievable property. Uh, probably the best property I've ever had the privilege to hunt, you know, all private land. Nobody hunts it. Uh, it was probably 15, you know, 15 to 1800 acres. And it was me and my buddy. And that was it. you know, nice. two people. Yeah. It. So you, you can imagine. <laughs> how did your, you know, how did your keys blood do with the, with the snowstorm? I saw you, <laughs> I saw you in. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's kind of a catch 22 with the hunting. I mean, you want, you know, that, that cold snap is really what gets them moving, uh, especially this time of year with the rut. And, uh, but you know, the downside to that is it's cold. And yeah. from, you know, if you're from the keys, I mean, it took me a couple of days to get acclimated to it, but you know, by the end of it, you know how to, you, you, you do kind of catch on pretty quick, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of guides, fishermen, kind of keys, people that, that really enjoy hunting. Um, I think a lot of them, it's like you started when you were like really little, but for a lot of them, they, they get to start their hunting career kind of later. And then it's just something that's in a way, I think it's kind of similar to what we do in the keys. And then in a way it's, it's like completely different and opposite. Like you're not on the water, you're in the woods, but you know, in so much of the type of fishing that, that we like to do, whether it's on the flats or like what you do with sail fishing, it is like hunting. What, what similarities do you draw between hunting and fishing? I mean, you know, for what I like to do uh, on the water, it's a lot of sight fishing. So mm-hmm. there's some huge similarities. I mean, there, it's very uh, connected in that sense of, you know, you're hunting them. You're not, you're not just putting baits out and waiting and hoping a fish comes and eats it on a spot, you know, where you're, you're actively searching, looking, you're hunting them, you're hunting the fish. So it is very similar in that, that fashion. Yeah. And what about your, what about your son? Has he really taken to it? You know, um, I have an older stepson, um, but my, my eight-year-old son, my eight-year-old boy, he, you know, he tends to get seasick. So that's kind of put a little, you know, damper on it. He still likes to go. He's been sick a hundred times probably. And he's, he's a tough little booger. So he, <laughs> we keep getting him out there. But, um, you know, I think the last hunting trip we went, we went and killed a hog and he really, he told me that he really enjoyed that nice. mainly because he didn't get seasick, but, um, but he does love the fish. You know, if you get him near the dock, he's got a hand line, he's going to drive you nuts. Dad, I need another bait. You know, and you're trying to get stuff done. So. Um, but he, he does love to fish, but like I said, you know, the, the getting seasick thing, hopefully that's something he's going to grow out of here soon. Yeah, I I, did. I got sick when I was younger. Did you really? And grew out of it. You just kind of, do you think you grew out of it or you just decided you're not getting seasick anymore and it's all in your head? Some people say it's in your head. I think a lot of it is, but I think you get, you know, I think your head gets used to being out there moving around. Yeah. When I was 14, I went with Rich Helmuth on the strike fighter out of Lorelei. And I went four days in a row. And after the first day, I literally was sick for eight straight hours. I couldn't even lift my head. But my brother, my older brother, he's like, hey, if you come back, they'll think you're tough. You know, he he talked me into being tough, basically. And I said, all right, I'll go back. By the fourth day, Rich looked at me and said, are you seriously going to get back on this boat? (laughs) Like, you're going to die. And, I, you know, so it was. But I went four days in a row and I, you know, I, I almost did die. And, uh, but then after that, I, it kind of went away. So I don't know. <laughs> For me, it was four days of just hell basically. And then, you know, I kind of got over it. Was that your start to charter fishing? Um, you know, I kind of grew up, I was born here in the Keys. So I, we, you know, I grew up kind of doing it, but it was, it was more, you know, with my dad or our family with smaller boats. So yeah, that probably was that was the beginning of the charter boat era for me. And, and, you know, maybe more of a professional side of that, um, you know, with Dirk, Dirk Wright was the mate. So it's kind of, you know, there's some old school names and, you know, and then I started with Alex when I was, um, 17, Alex almost 18. Adler. Yep. Rode with the Calex for about four years doing all the stuff that, you know, they didn't want to do. So <laughs> <laughs> like what, like being the mate in the, and working the cockpit and all that. Yeah. I was, I was the second mate and I got paid uh, 20 bucks a day to wash the boat at the end of the day. And I would have paid them 20 bucks to go. If, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I just, I was eating up with it and uh, 
I can remember many nights, eight, nine o'clock at night down there with my fingernail, you know, I was a hard worker. My dad instilled that in me and it, it was a very fulfilling thing to, you know, work hard and accomplish something. So I was, I was very driven, you know, those early years. That's a hell of a boat too, with a, with a oh, yeah. really important clientele. Uh, I mean, the people that, that go on that boat are not messing around. They've seen everything and, and there's going to be a pretty high standard, a pretty high bar for, for excellence. What, what did you learn from, from that gig when you're, when you're riding on that boat and doing that, like, did, did you see a new standard of, of performance, a new standard of, of what was required or, or did you, or were you already there? Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously Rich Helmuth was a, was a great fisherman, but their styles were, were very different. Um, Alex, um, you know, for lack of a better term, I mean, just super, very, very professional when, when it comes to communicating with the, the, the anglers and the customers. And, um, that part was a higher standard and the standard that was set was to be super well-rounded. It's not just about fishing. It's not just about being good with the customers. It's not just about being safe. It's about all those things and about doing them all well. So, and I think that really lends, um, that's a good way to learn as a mate, but also that instills, you know, some really, really important things as you move on to being a captain and stuff like that, to be aware of, you know, what's going on. I mean, Alex has eyes in the back of his head, basically, you know, he's, you don't think he's noticing everything that's going on, but he is. So yeah. that's awesome. And then when did you, when did you know that it was time for you to move on and do your own thing? Um, to be totally honest with you, this is maybe, you know, a little embarrassing to even say, but um, when I felt like I was, cause I started to ride along with some other captains and when I felt like they were doing things wrong, <laughs> I guess, you know, and, and for me that to be totally honest was kind of at an early age. I just felt like there's a better way to do that. I, I thought so. And, and, so and I'm not even saying I was right, but that that's really what kind of steered me that way. Right. And then when you, when you're kind of ready to take that, that jump, what, what's the next step for somebody that, you know, is like, maybe it's not even you, but like the, the mate to captain, what does that step look like? Cause a lot of people scary. kind of wonder that. Yeah. It's super scary. scary. And, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, financial risk and other things. What, what was it like for you? Um, you know, back in that day, it was, I think it was a little different. It was in some ways kind of like the wild, wild west, you know, mm -hmm. things have changed a lot. And that was the tail end of like kind of that old school, you know, mentality and, and the way things were done. Um, for me, I kind of lucked out, I guess you could say, uh, there was three single screw boats there and they were bigger boats and they were hard to drive and not many people wanted to do it. So, you know, those jobs were open up and one was a something special with Teddy D Esposito uh, the Carib Sea back when it was a single screw and then the Otter. And, you know, the first one I ran was uh, the something special and it was a very slow turning boat and there's current and wind and, you know, it's, it's dangerous and you got to be careful. But I can remember the first day I came in and I had to do it because there wasn't another, Teddy wasn't on the boat. It wasn't like, you know, it was either I did it or it didn't get done. And that first day coming down that channel, I mean, it was, it was scary, but, I can remember it even to this day where I thought about the worst case scenario and I kind of accepted it <laughs> and I just put it in the slip. I just kind of went for it. But, um, you know, and my mentality early on was to get in there, get turned around and be able to get out. That was my first priority. And then once I was in a position where I know I could get out, then if I was lined up, I would try to put it in the slip. But, you know, knowing that you're not going to make it early on, was key. It's like, and it's no embarrassment to, it's a lot less embarrassing to go back out and try again than it is to crash the boat, obviously. Right. So there's probably a lot of eyes on the new guide in that situation as well. <laughs> like, yeah. I think like, I, it would have been a funny joke if, you know, like six of the other captains would have been on the dock, with like poly balls and, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of what I thought. I was going to come into, but they, they had a little confidence in me. Yeah. Well, you made it. And, and obviously yeah. it was a, it was a, uh, a good move for you because your reputation these days is, is as good as anyone 
that I know of. I mean, you're, you're, you're really incredibly well thought of and your tournament resume speaks volumes for that. But just as a, just as a, a dude to fish with, man, I mean, I, I had no idea what to expect with you. We had never met when we shot saltwater experience and within, I don't know, one, one of the things that, that caught me off guard was I walked up to the boat and I was like, Hmm, I wonder if this is the mate or the captain or what. And I always like that because I'm like, this is the captain, but he seems like a mate, like he's doing all the work and, and everything. And then you just had this super, super cool demeanor. We got along right away. And, um, I don't know that that's, uh, it, it's, it's nice to see that, like that you, you is, it's kind of like leading by example, like you're, you're putting in the work, you're doing all the, all the, the, the tackle work and everything, all the details of stuff that maybe a lot of people don't really necessarily want to do. That's the mate's job. But uh, I noticed that right away with you. I appreciate that. You know, I, I think a lot of that, like I said, just comes from, you know, learning from people that did it right. And, you know, Alex, I mean, that's, it's like a hundred years of experience just handed to you. And, you know, even with that being said, I mean, it took me four years of going pretty much every day and uh, to, to really get the basics down. And I don't mean like, you know, you do the knot a couple of times and you think you got it. I mean, to really have, you know, a, a, a solid grip on all of it and to be really well-rounded with the seasons change, the dolphin season, the wintertime sail fishing and, you know, everything that comes along with that. So, you know, every time I see Alex, I tell him, Hey, you know, I appreciate you. So I, I remember that. That's nice. <clears throat> so you, one of the things that you mentioned just a minute ago was that it was kind of like the wild, wild west when, when you started and, and really when I started too, and there wasn't an internet and there were a lot of things that were, very different than today. What do you think has changed and what do you think has stayed the same? Hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, there's so much that's changed. Um, I mean, I hate to even say this out loud, but the truth is the work ethic, like you were talking about, I just, a lot of the, you know, and not all of them, I'm, I'm not saying all of them, you know, there's some really good up and coming guys, but just not, um, back then you just did it. You just got it done. You just, it, it wasn't an option, you know, you just suck it up buttercup and get it done. So I feel like, um, like you said, when you showed up and I was doing the work, I don't, I don't mind doing that. You know, I'd rather somebody younger than me do it now, but if they're not going to do it, just, I'll just get down there and do it. Cause it's gotta be done. And, uh, so I don't, for me, that's the biggest thing. And, and I would say in my frustrations, the frustrations I have these days, that's, that's usually the one that gets me really quick. If I see somebody that's just not willing to do it, you know, it's like, if, okay, get out of the way. I'll show you even, even at the age I'm at now, which is not old, but you know, if you're on the water all your life, 43 is kind of old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like, well, it's, it's a lot of experience. That's for sure. Um, yeah. The, 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 you know, the work ethic, I don't know. I had some kid call me the other day and he was asking about um, becoming a, a real, really what he wanted to do was, was kind of follow your path and maybe even go into the, into the private charter and be a private charter captain at some point. But he was asking me like, you know what I think, is it possible? And and my advice to him was, look, anything's possible if you work hard enough yeah. and you get down there and you, you got to take, you know, a position that may seem below you, right? Like you're going to get paid 20 bucks to clean the boat. Well, that is an opportunity. That's not an insult. Like, I don't know. I don't know that a lot of people see it that way, like, like you did right now. Maybe they do. I don't know. It's hard. It's, it's unfair to like take millennials or anybody younger and, and, and group them all together because I know some of, of the millennial, of what, who would be classified as millennials. And they're some of the hardest working people I know. And then I know some others that are definitely not. So I think it, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily an age group thing as much as it is like an individual kind of thing. So another thing that you're known for is your art. And, um, we talked about it a little bit when we were together about how that started, but I mean, you, you tell the story about just kind of sketching something out on a cocktail napkin. And then, I mean, is that really, is, is it that simple? Is that how it started? I mean, pretty close. I, you know, I always, I, even at an early age, I loved to draw, you know, I was really into art. I just wasn't very good at it. What kind of stuff would you draw when you were a kid? Fish? Uh, 
you know, I there was like uh like a Florida Gators. There was like this shirt, yeah, and it had it was a real gator, but it was like kind of a cartoonish, mm-hmm. and it had the jersey on with the baseball bat, and I I kind of copied that, you know, I drew it by looking at it, and uh, you know, it came out really well, and you know, that was kind of the beginning of it, and then. I always felt like I wasn't that good until I took an art class my senior year of high school and Mrs. Young, she taught me how to shade, you know, Mm -hmm. and and taught me about values and light and stuff. And that really just kind of unlocked it for me. Once I learned how to shade and I understood light, that was it. And, but, but even with that being said, then I didn't do it. I didn't really draw anything for years. You know, I got into fishing. I was just going busy. And I mean, it was probably, eight or 10 years after, you know, I graduated, I drew something one day. I don't even know why I just sat down. I drew it on a piece of paper. It was a sailfish and everybody just started flipping out. I was like, what, you know? And (laughs) so I I was super, you know, things like that, that you're not confident in. It's almost embarrassing. And it's really, especially with art, because with fishing, you're not really promoting yourself you go and you fish hard and you catch a lot of fish and maybe you win some tournaments and that's how you promote yourself. But it's not with the art business. It is kind of like a little bit of politics, you know, it's like, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies and Hey, look at my art, look at how good my art is. So that transition for me was, was tough. And, and even at an early stage of just drawing something and having people, you know, compliment it, I had to learn how to just say, you know what? Thank you. Hmm. Instead of, kind of downplaying it is is what was, was my tendency was just to downplay it like you know it's not that good and so I don't know it was it was kind of awkward at the beginning yeah well you started out just drawing and shading and then did you stay with kind of pencil and and um you know maybe pen I don't know what you're using my son uses um he does these these amazing things or I think they're amazing with any, he, and he does it with like a Sharpie and he'll like draw something. And then the way he shades is like these, a billion little dots with that Sharpie. And some of the stuff he's done is I, I can't even believe anybody could have the patience to do what he does, but it, it's pretty cool. But he's kind of moved from the, the pencil to, to this medium that he really likes of, of using kind of a Sharpie and other pens like that. What, what have you, what do you like to work with most? I actually like the pencil drawings. Uh, they're more fun for me. You take one utensil and you can kind of stick with that. And then it's just all about pressure and, and just how much you shade it. And, you know, you just can kind of do everything. And it's, it's highly detailed. It's, it's very detailed when you use a pencil. Um, but I, I kind of transitioned into the painting. Uh, I kind of got pushed into that. A gentleman reached out to me, wanted me to do this big painting now keep in mind I had never painted before I didn't know how to paint (laughs) and so I didn't want to take the job I was kind of throwing a number out there that I thought would just scare him off and then I wouldn't have to do it and I wouldn't have to tell him hey I'm I'm, I can draw really good but I'm not really that type of artist and um, so I don't know it was a very awkward time for me but um, I threw just a ridiculous number out there and the guy said I'll pay you extra if you can have it done in two weeks and I and I was like "Uh uh-oh (laughs) Wow. <laughs> so I went to another artist, um, Pasta, actually a local artist here. And I'm like, man, I'm way in over my head. I, you know, I need help. And I explained what was going on and somehow I pulled it off. You know, I mean, I wouldn't say it was one of the best, obviously, but the first painting I ever did, I sold for a lot of money. So, but that was kind of the eye opening experience where it's like, Hey, there's money to be made here and maybe there's something to it. So it, it definitely motivated me. How much time do you spend on art a year? Do you think compared to fishing? This year's been. I was putting more time into the art. Um, you know, when that when I, the story I just told when that started when I was first getting into it, mm-hmm. and it gained a lot of momentum very quickly, and I was doing really well uh, with it. You know, financially and just you know word of mouth around town. There was a buzz. Um, and then I just got really busy with the fishing again. I, I think because I was spending so much time with the art that I started to miss fishing. I realized how much I do love it, you know, and, and then I just got really busy with the fishing again, a lot of private jobs. And then we won a couple of tournaments and then that started to gain momentum again. 
And I started what I felt like was burning some of the art customers. Mm. And I didn't, I didn't think that was good. I, I thought it was better just to kind of shut it down almost for a little bit than to just keep telling people, no, I mean, you can only, somebody can only call you so many times, you know, and you say no before they're just like, well, that guy, you know, he doesn't have time to do it or he doesn't want to do it. And so I, I, I don't, don't know. it. I don't know, man. Artists are known as being kind of quirky and kind of, it almost is like the, the more aloof you can be, the more, the more valuable your, your stuff is to the point of once you're dead, that's when it's really the most valuable when there's going to be no more, like there's so many artists that like, that's when they really take off is when, when there's absolutely going to be no more art. I don't think that it's, I don't think that that will affect your art career at all. Like, I think that, you know, looking at it from an outside perspective, you need to be on the water in order to have the creativity to sit down and, and paint something or draw something like without that, if you just sit there and just, try to paint all the time it seems like at some point you're going to lose the the spark right that that like you saw that like one of my favorite ones that you did and you said it was one of yours as well is is um what lighthouse is it is tennessee that you did alligator alligator yeah. right uh-huh. so alligator and you just nailed that really well with the lighting and like the whole thing is like really good for somebody that's seen that a number of times and have been out there when the weather looks like that and everything. But I don't, I don't know that if you, if you're away from that for a while that you can just sit down and paint that from memory like that. Do you, I don't know. No, you can't. And, you know, I think the ones that are special to me, like that one means a lot. And, you know, I call that one born and bred, you know, I think about being born here in the keys and, you know, Bud Mary's is obviously you know, that's an old school place. It's been around forever. A lot of really famous fishermen, a lot of some of the best fishermen in the world have come out of there and continue to come out of there. Legends, you know, are from there. So um, for me, you know, that was all tied into the lighthouse. Obviously it's right off shore of Bud Mary's there. I've seen that lighthouse thousands of times. And uh, so, you know, I just kind of included everything when I think about the keys and growing up here and, you know, the, the heritage or whatever of it, that's kind of what I think about the lighthouse and sailfish jumping, the rough water, a warbird coming down. I even got a hurricane in there. I got the keys chain, you know, so it's that one meant something to me. And and I think I probably put a little more time into it. And it just, I don't know. I think, especially from an artistic standpoint, when your heart's in it, it just comes out better. It just seems to flow. Um, I, that's why I don't like, I don't really like doing commission pieces because you're trying to do something that that person wants and, mm-hmm. and from a, and that's fine in, in um, other work settings, like fishing for one, you just, whatever the person wants, you try your best to do that. But when it comes to a, you know, artistic place or a creative place, I guess is a better way of saying it. It's very hard to force creativity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's not something you can just sit down and I'm going to create this. It's, it's very hard for me to do that. So. Yeah. So far. You know, but yeah. probably a long time ago, it was very hard for you to give someone the exact fishing experience that they're looking for, you know, and then you get better and better at it and you get more and more comfortable with what, who, who knows, maybe that is something that you, that you grow into, you know, just looking at, at, you know, like how it might be similar to the fishing career. What about that first piece that you did? And that guy asked you to do it in two weeks. What, what did he want you to do? What is that? What was that first piece? I mean, it was a six foot you know, long canvas. It was like six feet by four feet. And, uh, it was a, a blue Marlin with the, his boat in it. And the blue Marlin came out really nice. The boat was nice, you know, and, and pasta kind of helped me. He said, because at the beginning it was not going well, obviously, <laughs> um, there's three or four paintings probably underneath that painting, but he just kind of, he guided me what he said was less is more, you know I mean? Especially at the beginning, it doesn't have to be this crazy masterpiece. It just needs to be, you know, less is more in it. I like the piece actually. I think it, especially even looking back in hindsight, I look at it and, you know, I definitely don't hate it. It, it, it looked good. And uh, so I don't know. I mean, everybody has their story, how they start out. Mine for me, is kind of crazy. I think that's crazy how it, how it happened. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how it went. So. And do you have, um, I mean, do you think that maybe when you, that you'll sp- start spending more time on art at some point in your career? Is that what you're actually, thinking about doing? 
Yeah, I mean, actually, just the last couple of days, there's kind of been a development where I have a space because, you know, my house with all the fishing stuff. Sorry about that. Sorry. I muted it. Oh, it's just, it's going to come through the computer no matter what. Um, so, yeah, there's, you know, there's uh, a space that's opened up to where I can go there any time of night. You know what I'm saying? if Because that's really when I'm going to have time to do it with all the fishing stuff. And that's how I was doing it. You know, when I first started, I was doing a lot of that at night. I mean, I was up till I wasn't getting a lot of sleep. I was fishing in the daytime, doing art at night and uh, really just busting my butt to get it done. But uh, just recently, I've opened, there's a space that's opened up. It's kind of a gallery. Um, it's going to be a gallery slash storefront slash workspace also. Um, so that's really got me motivated to, to do, to do it, you know, to have your space with all your paint set up and some room to work. You know, I was, all those paintings I was doing early on were, I was put them on my wall on my living room wall and I was painting <laughs> I had to paint all over my living room wall. And about once every two months I would repaint my wall and start over. Like I would just paint it all. I mean, it was, it was crazy, but you know, I was, I didn't even have an easel. I would just hang the painting up and I was painting them in my living room. Wow. How many other artists do you think operate like that? Not many. <laughs> I hope not <laughs> for their sake. <laughs> and your wife all was good with that? Uh, for, for a while, but you know, actually I'm, I'm divorced. So I'm, you know, we're unfortunately it didn't work out, but yeah. that was, that was before, you know, so I, that was a single, a single painter's, you know, life. I don't think that would, yeah, the wife wouldn't be too happy about that. Right. <laughs> Wow, man, that's awesome. That, I mean, you just got that on your living room wall. You're getting paint everywhere, and you're repainting your wall every every couple of months after you finish up a painting. That's yeah, because there'd be you know I do two, three, four, or five paintings, so there'd be multiple colors. Like there'd be a you know a square. Yeah, all the paint would be on the outside of it. Right. It's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I probably have pictures of that somewhere. Your your wall was was art at the end. Like, and that's why I could only, I would do one and then I'd have to get that one out of the way. Cause I only had that one spot and there'd be paint on the floor. And, you know, I think I had a leather couch. There's probably some paint on that too. Was, yeah. <laughs> paint everywhere. Low, low budget. <laughs> a low budget. <laughs> that's awesome. So this new space, you feel like, um, with, with, with space where you can have it all out all the time that that will, um, have you painting a lot more. I think it will. Um, cause you're, you know, if you get frustrated when you're trying to paint, if you don't have the space and you're just unorganized, it, it, you know, kind of frustrates you. And it's hard to work like that. Again, with the creative mind, it's just very, it just doesn't lend itself to that. Yeah. You know? Well, some, some people like the creative, the creative types, you see it all in all types of, of different environments. Like some people like to have like a super clean, like everything needs to be super clean and organized and then they can go at it. And then you see these other artist studios and they're just like this jumble. I mean, one thing that it's not is it's not anything other than painting and stuff. It's like, everything is like paint, but it's just everywhere. And it's, it's amazing. Like how they can make sense of anything, but um, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like I need a place, like I need a place for my fishing gear, I need a place for my workout gear. I need a place. And if I don't have that place, it becomes more and more difficult to, you know, do whatever it is I'm, I'm trying to do, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm definitely excited, you know, to have that space and, um, and we're going to, you know, I'm trying to move forward with, uh, setting up an online store so I can, it just, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that I want to do with apparel. I have some, what I think are good ideas. I think they'll, they'll, uh, they'll go far, yeah. but it's just a matter of having time and it's a matter of doing it. You just, at some point you got to quit talking about it and you just got to do it. Yeah. So, well, do you find the time, do you find it to where you got to quit talking about it and doing it and in doing that step, you have to back off the fishing a little bit, or do you have kind of bandwidth and time to do both? Well, I think originally, you know, at the beginning, I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to back off the fishing a little bit, but I don't plan on doing that long term. Um, I, what I want to do, especially with the online store, is to try to set it up to where I do the work once and reap the benefit multiple times, and I don't have to be so much hands on. You know, mm -hmm. where somebody takes the order, they can fill the order, ship the order. You know, just the the logistics of that are a little tricky. Just getting everything set up and and uh, 
like quality control, you know what I'm saying? Making sure that, that the product that I'm putting out or they're putting out for me is what I want to rep, you know, be represented by. So mm -hmm. you got people helping you with that? Mm, kind of a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. I'm, I'm just a stinky old fisherman who can draw a little bit. So I, for me, it's, you know, that stuff is not super technical and I, and I think I probably could do it, but you know, it takes time. And yeah, it like takes I said, time. if you do it once, if you do it once and then two months goes by and you're like, how did I do it? If you, you know, if I sat down for a month and did it every day for a month, I probably would never forget it again. But just, well, there's something else to, too about, you know, even, even that business of like online, um, advertising, online marketing, uh, just operating a store like that. It's a lot of ways it's like fishing. Like if you took a month off fishing, you're going to be kind of rusty when you come back, you'd be like, well, you know, maybe the bait's going to be here. Maybe it's not, I don't know where today, you know, exactly where it is. You go out there every single day. So very similar to, to the online marketing, like that stuff changes all the time with all these algorithms from Google and all these other things and people that are on top of it, they, they stay on top of it. Like that's their, that's their creative mind. I mean, yeah. it seems very analytical, but people can be incredibly creative about how they market all that stuff and do it for you. I don't know. I'm strongly in favor of, of having somebody help you with all that stuff. Cause I think it's, I think you're competing with like, it's it's funny like you may not even be competing with um another website or whatever because they're not even an art website or but it's it's you're competing over people's time right so that people get on the internet and they either see your stuff or they don't and if they're not seeing your stuff they're seeing some, somebody else's stuff is getting served up to them and then they just there's only so much time they don't see it so some people know how to keep that in front of people. And some people, I don't know, I don't like, it seems really difficult to me, but you know, it's not my gig. So I'm glad you got somebody helping you with it. Cause that's, that's going to be awesome. So do you have any apparel pieces out now? Uh, you know, I, there's a little deal that I have with a, a gentleman, a friend of mine. Um, it's called keys deep. And, um, uh, some of my artwork is featured on those shirts. It's shirts, hats, nice buddies and stuff like that. And it, you know, it's going pretty well, but it's a new business and he's still getting off the ground. This is the first year. Um, you know, so there's always challenges with that, but, but I think it's going well. Yeah. It's That's awesome, well. man. So what, uh, what about the, um, the hunting, you got other things coming up. We were talking about Turkey hunting in the, in the beginning before we started the podcast. Um, is that, is that your next season? Is that what you're preparing for? Yeah. I want to get my son, you know, he's eight and he's for some reason he's infatuated with turkeys. I know why he's kind of a, uh, he's like a, a knickknack collector. You know what I mean? <laughs> he'll loves feathers. Like we go in the woods, he'll find a Turkey feather or something. And <laughs> he's just, I don't know. He likes collecting little trinkets and, um, but he wants to shoot a turkey and he's been telling me this for a long time, but he finally let it slip the other day. He really wants to shoot it because he wants all the, feather, you know, the tail feathers. He's like, but I want the whole, I want all the feathers, every single one of them. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, yep. But you can make this beautiful. The the first uh, turkey that my, my son ever shot, I had seen this before and like the, I, I gave it to a taxidermist. I could probably do it myself these days, but the taxidermist did a really good job on it. And he fanned that out really good. And the fan was, you know, it was a big turkey. So the fan was really big and the feathers were perfect. Like didn't have any pellet holes in any of the feathers or anything. They were really perfect. So it goes like that. And then it's got matting in it, like, like a, like an art print. Right. And, and it's, it's shadow boxed in. And at the bottom, uh, he took the, the spurs and he he cut them um to where they're only about maybe three inches of the spur so it's just three inches of the leg with the spur and then i guess he he somehow took all the skin off of it so it's just like bone and those the spurs are on either side and then the beard's in the middle and the the whole thing is up there and it's framed in barn wood it's really nice. I mean, that does sound nice. it's really, really nice. And my son will probably keep that for the rest of, I know he will, he'll keep it for the rest of his life. Um, but that's, I don't know. I really liked it. I liked how it was in a frame and it was like a, it was like a picture and it's just, I don't know. It's really, really cool. So he'll, well, he'll yeah. probably want to just do it himself though. 
Yeah, but doing it the way you said is that that's something that's going to last. You know what I'm saying? If you just got feathers hanging around, I mean, they just, you know, you move one time and I know. they just don't hold up like that. But what you're talking about, that's something, like you said, it'll probably yeah. have it forever. I'll send you a picture of it. It's, uh, I, he, he left it here. It's, he didn't take it to Montana, but he left it here because, well, he may take it back when he comes now because he's got a real house. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't even want to take it to college. He was like, man, I love that thing, but I don't want it getting messed up. You know, he knew he's got a mallard duck you know, with the wings cupped done by this, this amazing taxidermist. And then he's got that. Um, and then now he's all into elk hunting and everything else. So that boy is going to need a big house. I told him, I was like, man, you keep up this, this, this elk, um, obsession and you're going to, you're going to make plenty of money because you're going to need a really big house. I mean, elk antlers are so big that you to put them in a standard room, you, you got to hang them down below waist level other one, and they're touching the ceiling so, yeah i mean if it, if it didn't have horns just the, the the shoulder mount or head mount it's like they're so like big but the antlers on top of that it, there's no way it fit i just have to put it on the floor right and my they're so <laughs> big that's like if you look at cameron haynes workout room all his stuff is like on the almost on the ground and and the antlers are are almost touching the ceiling and that's just how big an elk is they're just they're just massive but we had we had a really awesome trip out there this year and he he's been trying to kill an elk um for five years uh with a bow and uh and he finally got it done i mean awesome. and, and it all happened just well finally ultimately it happened the way that we had all seen the videos and read the books and the articles and 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 it all happened like that but leading up to that you're, we were just kind of like, I don't think this is ever going to happen, you know? And that's the, that's what I like so much about the hunting and the, well, it's, it's very much the same in the fishing world too. I mean, there's so many situations like that to where you're trying to catch this fish that you want to catch. And maybe you've never caught one before, whether that's a sailfish or a permit or something that's kind of elusive. And you just can't see how this is going to happen because you have all these close calls and to the people that have experience, they're like, Oh man, Oh, I thought you were going to get that one. And it's like, really? Because it just seems like that's a long way away from actually catching that fish. And that's how it seemed with the elk. Like we just couldn't see it. I couldn't see it materialize. But then when it happened, it's like, wow, we really were close all those other times. Like if that thing had taken three more steps this way, we would have, we'd have closed the deal three other times, but it didn't. And then it seems impossible. I don't know. The That's, that's, I love that about the, about the hunting and I'm kind of into white tail. Like, well, I'm kind of not, but I, I like the elk. The elk hunting is, is amazing. I always you, wanted to do the elk hunting. And, you got to do it. And I'm, I don't know if I'm into, I don't know if I would uh, paint with such a broad brush as far as the white tails. For me, it's the Midwest. Yes. You know what I mean? There's For sure. Kansas, Missouri, like places where you can go put your eyes on a big, mature buck and you got a really good shot if you're a good hunter and you know what you're doing to get on those deer i mean i took i took a six-year-old and a 16-year-old and we went to kansas big trip went up there bow hunting and we ground hunted i mean we were so close like by myself we, i'd have killed those deer you know but so close so many times with them on the ground you know with two kids basically and i mean we had a ball and um you know, it was, but, but that to me is, it, but it's, I feel like it's similar to elk hunting. You know, those, those deer will come to the calls. I've, sure. I've done the camp week and have them come running where uh, the first day we were there, I told, I set my 16 year old up and I said, go down here. He's going to try to get our wind. And I called to the deer and he came right to me on a rope, but it's kind of a long story, but there was a couple different deer. The first one came in and left. So we gave up on the plan and he came back to where I was. And then the other deer, 135 inch, you know, eight point nice deer for 16 years old. First bow kill. That would have been a great, you know, it was a nice yeah. deer. Yeah. And he did exactly what we said he was going to do, but we had already given up on the plan. He would have had a 10 yard shot broadside, but uh, anyways, so yeah, I, I agree with you. The elk thing, that's definitely a bucket list for me. Yeah. It, I mean, there's obviously a lot of ways to do it and I'm no expert on elk hunting. I'm the, I'm a real beginner. In fact, my son is, is breaking into where he's, you know, starting to really kind of understand what it takes and be able to do the homework. Like he's kind of like, 
don't know. It's kind of like maybe he's at the place in a fishing world that we would know of is like, he like won his first tournament, right? Like, and now it's like, okay, you're either going to just stop there or you're going to start winning a lot of tournaments like, or being right at the top, you know? And, and that's kind of where he is in his, in his evolution. And then my other son is kind of, is, is, is kind of there. Like I want to enter my first tournament. Like, and he, he killed a big, uh, a huge antelope this year. And then he got a a really big white tail out in Montana as well, but still hasn't done the elk. But next year, man, I'm thinking about possibly spending the whole month of, of September or at least part of September and part of October out there and just going for it, man. But I'll tell you what, my truck or your truck. (laughs) Yeah. We'll take both. We'll take both. Let's do it. Let's do it. I love, I love the whole uh, idea of it, but I'll tell you what, the way we did it this year was incredibly hard work. And, and, you know, I see all this, you know, the stuff with Cameron Haynes and everybody talking about, you know, how hard it is and how good a shape you got to be in and all that stuff. And, and I experienced it and I'm sure there's plenty of ways to elk hunt, but public land by yourself, no guide, no, ATV, no horse on foot. Woo. I mean, we, we came up with this, we came up with this little saying, we were like, wow, just when you think it's going to get easier, it gets harder. And then that little, that little catchphrase that we had, we, it, we used it all week, like not just day one, then it was day two. Like you would, f- it's like, you're walking all over the place trying to find elk and then when you find them, you're like, okay, now it's going to get a little easier. Like we know where they are. No, then it gets really harder because now you're following them up these mountains and these ridgelines. And, and then you're like, okay, well now we've, we've gotten close to them. So it's going to get easier. Well, it got harder again, like all the way to the point of killing one. And now you have this thing that's literally the size of a horse and you're like, okay, now all we got to do is get it out. Like the hard part's done. We got him. And then it's like, uh, uh-uh. that you're about to carry massive weight out of here. And, uh, it's not getting any easier all the way to the end. It's just like, man, every time we thought it was going to get easier, it got harder, which I love that part. Like, that's what I signed up for, but then there's actually doing it, you know, like I like hard things, but then at some point you're doing these hard things and you're like, Whoa, these are like, harder than I thought, <laughs> thought they were going to be. Yeah. And that's something you, you explain to somebody and they're like, yeah, I know, I know, but, or I know, I know. And then they get there and they're like, wow. I mean, you were right. This is, <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to make it to me that my son explained that to me and I'm working out all year long and I'm thinking, and I've got this trip in the back of my head and I'm thinking, I just need to keep up with my son. Like I was, I was more worried about keeping up with my son than I was what the physical, um, uh, requirements of the, of the hunt were going to be. Right. And so it became less about keeping up with him and he's six foot one and he has a much bigger stride than I do. And he's strong and he can carry lots of stuff. But this was like, you know, we were both trying to keep up with the requirements of the hunt, which is, it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier is there's a bar, a high bar set and that bar is the standard of the elk and the elk is like, there's no messing around. Like that's a super tough animal that lives in super, I mean, it's a very, very strenuous type environment where what they do looks effortless. They just go walking up this hill and and you go walk up that hill and it's like, Whoa, this hill is super steep. When I, when, when we were, uh, uh, field dressing that, that elk, I couldn't believe the size of the Achilles tendon on that, on that animal. Like, I just, I, I mean, this is, it's like, it's big around like this, like, Oh my God, that's the Achilles tendon. And you look at that on like a white tail or an antelope or something like that. And it's this little bitty thing, you know, and this couldn't help but think like, that looks like a giant kangaroo leg. That's what I, that's what I thought the first time I saw it without any skin on, I was like, Oh my God. This thing is huge, but I was just watching a YouTube video. Actually, I think it was yesterday and it was elk and there, you know, there's four or five bulls that are running back and forth, like to a point. And then the cows kind of, you know, there's, I don't know how many cows and they're just, I mean, just full contact. 
elk running right in the guy's face. I mean, one came probably with eight feet of the guy. I mean, to the point where it was like you kind of abandoned the thought of hunting, and now you're you're looking for the nearest tree to get behind. You You know, I mean, you can tell the guy was like because he could have shot it, but he had already. He was in a different mindset. It was like, okay, where am I going to go? This thing. Yeah, did I? I, I really wanted steps. to do this. <laughs> now you find yourself in the middle of it. Well, that was kind of the situation with us. Is that we, we, you know, I had seen videos like that. And I'm like, man, I just don't think this is ever going to happen. Like, like we've not seen this situation. And and then one day it did, and we were we were right there in the middle of like what you just ex- described, and and we did not capitalize on that opportunity. And I'm like, well, if we can't do it, then then how is this ever going to happen? And that's what I kept, you know, what I was t- saying earlier is like I just couldn't visualize how this was going to happen because we kept getting in these these good situations. I'm like, man, it has to happen now, and it and it didn't, you know. But then I look back on it after it did happen. I'm like, oh, we were centimeters away from it happening. You know, that reminds me of sword fishing. That's how we felt early on, you know, and we're like, we're just so far away. Like you said, I mean, we're just obviously we're doing something way wrong. And we really weren't. I mean, we were doing some stuff wrong, but it wasn't We really weren't that far from doing it right. And when it did happen, it was like the fish ate the bait. We hooked it. We wound it to the boat, killed it. I mean, it was like, oh, it was easy actually and so then what happens like in that situation where where you then all of a sudden you just start catching them like i don't know i mean it's i a lot of it's confidence i think tournament same thing you said you know we use the analogy like a tournament as a perfect analogy is actually what i was thinking about before you said that i was thinking that because there is like that breakthrough you know And, and what i think it just you prove to yourself that it is possible. Like you said, this is never going to happen, but once it does, you know, you just, it's a confidence thing. I, I think I can contribute that to a lot of my fishing success is, you know, when you know, you'll stay later, you stay longer, you're, you're more aware because in your mind it can happen any second. So it just keeps you more alert. I don't know. There's something to it for sure. Well, it, it, there is something to it because whether it's offshore tournaments or inshore tournaments, you know, I say it all the time, but you know, you have the same six or seven names on that board at the top. Now there's maybe six or seven others are all interchangeable up in there and, and those, but the same guys end up at the top. And that's a mindset thing. Like they're dealing with the same things as everybody else. There's weather, there's wind, there's what you're you're dealing with a wild animal. There are things that, that, you know, are out of your control, but how do the same people keep at the top? And in my opinion, it's confidence, it's preparation, it's mindset. It's, it's that they expect to, to win, right? Like they're not hoping they expect to win expect to catch fish that's like you when you go out you know on a charter or in a tournament you expect to win and there's other people that are just participating in that same tournament and they might do well but there's a big difference between participating and expecting yep and especially in the dolphin tournaments i can remember that where you know when you finally do find that big fish and catch them it's not you're not shocked you're happy you're excited and, you know, it's a great feeling, but it's not like, I can't believe that just happened. You know, it, the only time I really felt like that was the second year, you know, with 15 minutes ago, that tournament's hard to win once, you know, and the skippers. And I do remember thinking that, like, that was, you know, one of the few times where it was, you know, we expect to win, but, you know, that reality, that realization that, man, we just did that two years in a row. And yeah, there's some luck involved, but you know, I mean, you know, some people's definition of luck is, is, you know, where uh, preparation and opportunity meet. And that's what I really think happens in some of those tournaments. You keep going and going and going and going. And right when you feel like the first year we won it on the way home, we went, we were probably 30 miles below the West Hump from Key Largo. <laughs> and we caught that fish 750 feet of water straight out front of Key Largo. How you know, big was, was that fish the first year? 42 pounds. 42. Yeah. To win. And it was on the way home. We had, um, you know, 15 minutes maybe. So it was, but like, again, if we hadn't have been looking all the way to the end, we wouldn't see, you know, it was a, a couple birds on a pallet and that was it. 
you know, wow. after all that hard work, two birds on a pallet right out front. There he is. So it just obviously there's some luck involved in that. But again, you know, just not giving up. Then in that but, second tournament, second year, um, what happens to repeat? Um, grinding it out. And I'm trying to think. It was slow that year. It was slow that year. We just made some good moves. You know, we we did have a plan. There was a rhyme and a reason to it. It wasn't that we just went fishing. We kind of um, – we had pre-fished a couple of days before. It wasn't a lot of fish down to the west. And we went way up to the east, and, and we got on a – the birds were not on them. So we got out deep, and uh, we found a weed line. And I kind of stayed far enough off the weed line to where I could run and not spook fish, but I could still see. And the birds weren't on them or nothing. We just found them swimming. It was a big pack of – heavy, you know, like gaffers, slammers, and we kind of picked away. We actually had won it on the first day. We just didn't know it yet. Or mm. in the morning, we caught a 14 pounder that put us ahead, but obviously we didn't know that until the very end. And on the way home, we caught a 32 pounder that, you know, pretty much was the nail. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that fish was actually really funny because it was the same scenario. Slick calm. The birds were not on them. There really wasn't a lot of birds, period. And, uh, we fished hard that day. We came back in and we had 30 minutes left to fish. And I just got on some scattered weed, got in the tower, we put one little bait out and we were just sight fishing, just kind of easing up the weed. I looked over at Anthony. I said, I said, I mean, after all that running around we did today, like, seriously, like what's the odds of, you know, like a, a slammer just swimming through this weed. And he goes, look, a schoolie. And I looked and it was like 12 schoolies and a 32 pounder. <laughs> I mean, you can't even make it was the timing of it was just unbelievable. It was like, I just said that I was a pretty good evidently. Cause there he is, but <laughs> you know, those are what dreams are made of, I guess. Yeah, That's awesome, man. Um, so are you going to be doing the, the sailfish tournaments this year? Uh, we actually have a junior sailfish tournament coming up this weekend. So we're real excited about that. Uh, you know, some clients of mine that uh, were with us in July, we caught 21 sales in July, which is just strange, Wow! but you know, we were happy to see it. They wanted to catch one. They fished me three days. I think we caught um, like, I think it was like 30 sales in three days in July. And they had nine people that had come down with them. They didn't all go on the same day, but you know, they kind of, you know, as the three days went on, everybody had an opportunity. Nine people caught their first sailfish. Wow. So it was just an <laughs> epic, you know, just epic. So that kind of started the conversation. I said, Hey, cause he's got two, you know, two sons that are really, um, talented, you know, they're talented fishermen and they were casting to their own fish and hooking them and doing, you know, doing the whole thing. Um, so great anglers. And I said, Hey, you know, be, if you guys wanted, we could do the junior sailfish tournament and they agreed to it. So I'm, Looking forward to it. We should be competitive, hopefully. I would think so. Um, the numbers of sailfish, uh, especially being caught, like, I mean, you were part, you were the captain of of the day when you guys went out and caught 76, right, to, to have the Keys yep. record. That's an incredible number. And it's a number that, you know, seems to be so high. Like, what what has happened that, so that the the numbers that you're bringing in, like that day you caught – you know, 2021, another day you catch 76, which is obviously that's, that's a very high number if it's the record, but what has happened to have some boats catching so many sailfish in the Florida Keys these days? I mean, I think there is more sailfish just, you know, um, conservation wise, you know, a lot of people don't kill them. There's a lot of people that have gotten on board with that rightly. So there's, you know, there's other fish, there's plenty of other edible fish. There's really no reason to kill them. I'm fine with somebody, you know, killing one to be honest with you, but it's not something we do. It's definitely not something we, you know, people that I know or people that are in the business do consistently every now and then maybe something happens and the fish doesn't do well. And, you know, you take it home, but even those days we don't, it's not like something we're going to hang up on the rack and advertise, um, you know, but that's an opinion. Um, so that's kind of a touchy subject. It can be, mm -hmm. uh, I feel the way I feel about it and I'm confident in the way I feel about it. Um, but anyways, yeah, I, I do think there's more because of con conservation, but those situations that you were referring, referring to like the 21 in July and then the 76 day, those are uh, conditions that make up that 
concentrate the fish in such a, a tight area that it, it's like every sailfish within a hundred miles of there is right in that condition. And that really what you have going on. And, and the reason I say that uh, confidently is because I think it was the very next day and definitely the, the days following that. I mean, we caught 76 sailfish and I think we went the the day after that, not, not the day after, but the day, you know, two days after. And there's, there was, they were just gone. I mean, that whole body of fish had moved up the road and because it's so concentrated, there's no stragglers around it. Right. I mean, every fish within miles is in caught up in that one condition. So, wow. And so, um, those days that, that like those next days, are you getting reports from up the road that somebody else is, is doing really well with them and other boats are catching tons? Yeah. I mean, when we caught our 76, we were sight fishing, you know, they were tailing, which basically means the sailfish are surfing down the waves and the water color is, uh, there's a huge contrast between the color of the fish, which is like a, you know, black color normally. Right. Um, and what we're, you know, the water color that we were fishing in is like a powder blue. So as Teddy, the Esposito used to say, it's, they stand out like an Oreo in a glass of milk. You know <laughs> I mean, you get to see them coming down the wave. Uh, it was, you know, a huge contrast there. Um, but as those fish pushed up the road, you know, the day after that, and even I think the following day, there was reports of people off of Ocean Reef getting 50 bites on the kites. Wow. Just having their baits out, you know, with the kites up. So that's, I mean, to me, that's even a more impressive number, you know, to, to yeah. be able to hunt them, hunt them down and, and drive around and go right to the fish and throw a bait right at the fish is what we were doing. Um, you're going to, you're going to have more shots, you know, but to, just to put your baits out, the concentration of fish that there has to be to get 50 bites on your kites. That's, that's impressive. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so yeah, you can, you can kind of see how they're traveling. Um, the two weeks, the reason why we were on that condition so well, the reason we timed it so well is because like you're saying, the boats down the road towards Key West two weeks before they had broke the record, which was 70. Mm. They broke, they caught 70 two weeks before we caught our 76. And uh, that condition was kind of slowly pushing up the road. But a lot of things have to come together. You know, you have to have the water color. You have to have that hard northeast current, which is basically the Gulf Stream that tucks way in tight to the reef. And then you have to have the the correct wind direction and you got to have enough wind. So, you know, they caught 70 and the condition kind of died out for a couple of weeks. But the water was there. We had some of the components were still there. And when we looked at the, you know, the weather forecast for, I think it was a Thursday, the wind picked back up out of the east at like 20 knots. And it wasn't just us. Everybody pretty much knew it was it was going to go off. So we, but yeah, it's definitely helpful. And, and you can learn a lot like that too, when you talk to other boats and, you know, you don't have to be there to physically see the migration pattern, but you can just talking to other people, you can see it was down there. Now it's up here right. and so on. You also need the team. Like you can't just go out there with just Joe Blow from Ohio that's never caught, you know, a sailfish before. I mean, you need like to catch 76 anything. I mean, I don't care. Catch 76 Jack Cravel. Like you still, you got, that's work. Like that's a lot of fish of any kind of fish. That's amazing. That's cool. Yeah, because this summer we caught, I think one day we caught 50 dolphin, which normally, you know, we catch our 30 and we don't try to pound them too hard, you know, but we'll catch what we need for dinner and, and go home. And 30 is a lot of fish. Yeah. But there was one day we had, um, Scott had some friends down and I think we caught our 50 dolphin and we laid them out all on the dock. And I remember looking at my stepson who was on the boat with us the day we caught all the sailfish and just looking at those 50 dolphin on the dock. I'm like, look how many fish that is. And then think we caught 76 sailfish in one day. I mean, it, you know, even for us, it's, you know, it's surreal. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a big number. It is a big number. When we went to, when we used to go and fish with the, the boys in Louisiana a lot for the redfish tournaments, <clears throat> I noticed that they had a, a door clicker on, mounted on a, like, well, like a, what a doorman holds in his hand. It's mounted on a piece of, of a two by four and they kept it up by the trolling motor and they would touch it with their foot on every fish. And he, <laughs> I was like, why do you do that? He goes, Oh, because it's easy to exaggerate. And I said, okay. And he's like, we keep track of every fish. 
because yep. it's easy to come in and say you caught 200 when really you caught 58. And yeah. he's like, you wouldn't believe at the end of the day, he would say, all right, that was an awesome day. How many fish do you think you caught? And the people, like, we must have caught 250. And he's like, 74. And he's like, what? He's like, yep, 74. Because he wanted, like, if they did get to the point to where they caught 100 or some benchmark number, he wanted that to be a real, um, you know, trophy for these right. people. Like, yeah, a real, like. That's a that's a benchmark to get to a hundred is really hard, and um, you know so he would he would keep that that doorman's clicker on there and and he always had a lower number than and you would see him he would release one click release one click release another one click like how many are we up to he's like seventeen like, wow it seems like it's eighty you know but uh, yeah when you really keep track and you really count it's usually less than less than you thought. You know, and when they caught originally, when they caught 70 and I heard about that, I'm just like, man, that is a monster number. I mean, I think the most I ever caught before that was I caught 26 in a day, you know, which is, which is a great day, yeah. but it's not, I wouldn't consider that, you know, spectacular or anything. Um, but when I heard that 70 number, I kind of thought the same thing. I'm like, how would you, I mean, how would you keep up with that? You know, you could, <laughs> you would think that you could easily lose count. Yeah. But what I learned as our day went on, is that when you have so many people on the boat, we probably had 10 people on the boat and you're, you're literally yelling it out every time you catch a fish number eight, you know, cause when you have a tailing condition, you, you know that you're, I mean, you can see them and they're just coming and coming and coming. you you know that this is going to get, this is going to be a big day. Mm -hmm. You know I mean? We crossed the <laughs> reef. We, we probably caught the first eight in the first 15 minutes. That's awesome. We had eight man. fish in the first 15 minutes. I came across the reef and I saw one instantly. And I'm like, Oh, it's going to be good. Go. So it's awesome. <laughs> but, yeah, I can remember getting to 50 and thinking we got to catch 21 more of these. I mean, 50, like we had been doing that all day, you know, it was hard work. It's not, I think from probably about 40 on, it really wasn't that much fun anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it started to become work. I had to pee at like nine 30 in the morning and I didn't come down till eight. <laughs> have no water no chips no sandwich i mean it was just you know you're in the zone and it was exhausting it, it was painful it, it really was it was painful it was a like that's the part i don't think people realize it's not it was great it was fun but it was a lot of work and and the truth is i i know that we could have caught more but it was like you know we got to 70 we caught 71 and kind of broke the record it was like two fish tailed in the side of the boat and nobody had a rod. Everybody was on their phone, you know? And I'm like, after the second or third fish that tailed by us that we didn't even try to catch, I was like, Hey, are we going home? We're going to catch some more. What are we doing? <laughs> so it was, Man, when it's but, good, it's good. I guess that's, that's the moral to the story. When it's good, it's good. You better take was, advantage of it because the next day it might be, might be over. Yeah. And I mean, you know, somebody might break that, Eventually they probably will, but they're going to have to earn it. I will yeah. tell you that a yeah. lot more work to realize, you know, <laughs> that's awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you being on today and, um, it's, it's been great to, to get to know you and catch up. We got you on the, uh, saltwater experience coming up, probably be out in February or March. Probably I would think our, our episode will be out, but, uh, you can wait to see Sam on there or you could find him other places. If people wanted to follow you and find you and check out your art, maybe buy some t-shirts, what do they do? Yeah. I mean, I'm working on that. I do have a website set up, but like I said, you know, I just been so busy with the fishing. Um, there is a Sam Lazo art dot, you know, www.samlazoart.com. Um, and there's some stuff on there, you know, we're working to get the online store set up. Like I, like I mentioned, um, also you can, some of the stuff you can view is actually on Sam Malazzo fishing on Instagram. That's the main platform that I use for, you know, my social media. And I do have a face, <coughs> excuse me, a Facebook account, but nowadays I'm really not on there a whole lot. So Instagram or nothing. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's it's what I do. Yep. I hadn't been yep. to Facebook in like, years. It's linked to my Facebook. So, you know, when I post something, it, it just goes there, but like I said, I, I'm not on there a whole lot anymore these days. All right. Well, check him out. He's a fantastic artist and a great charter captain. If you uh, are in need of either one of those things, check him out. <laughs>
All right, Sam. That's awesome, man. Thank you for uh, being on today. And uh, we'll we'll talk to you soon. I hope to see you soon. And I do have to mention, um, we're at Worldwide Sports. Oh, yeah. Richmond, so we're available for charter. So thank you. All right. All right, man. All right, we'll see you.